Hello, welcome to Iowa City Church Online. My name is Chris Coker. I'm the family pastor here and one of the online hosts for our weekend worship service. If this is the first time you're checking out our church online, we are so excited that you're here. And we want to let you know that we love you and we are praying for you and your family. Today, Pastor Tom continues our sermon series, Recalibrate. Last week, we focused in on how we can recalibrate our mind by replacing the negative things in our mind with bite-sized pieces of God's Word that we could focus on throughout the day. Today, we focus in on how we can recalibrate our heart. And we look forward to sharing that message with you in just a minute. Now, as our worship team begins today, we'll have a song, we'll have teaching from Pastor Tom, and at the very end of the service, we'll have a time for communion. If you have questions about how to do communion at home, you can check out our website at iowacitychurch.org backslash communion for all the details. We also want to continue to thank everyone who has given generously through these trying times. Your generosity has allowed us to continue to do ministry here in Iowa City and across the world now online. If you're able and you would like to give, you can click the Count Me In button on the right-hand side of the chat window, or you can go on our website, click on the Count Me In button, and there you can learn how to donate through PayPal or by mailing in a check to the church. Let's pray, and let's begin a great day of worship today. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, that you allow your word to recalibrate our minds and our heart. We ask as we sing and as we listen today from Pastor Tom, we ask that you help us to align our heart to match what you want us to be. God, we love you and we thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. You are a refuge. You have no border. When I was a stranger knocking at your door, you took me in With no questions, in no conditions When I was a sinner running from your grace, you called me friend You called me friend Cause there are no So was shipwrecked, tossed upon the waves, you calmed the storm. You are the Father, there are no orphans. Every tribe and nation gathered in your arms sings with one voice. Sings with one voice. There are no Well 
Hey church family, welcome to part two of our series, Recalibrate. Um, a couple years ago, my heart started acting weird. It just started having some weird feelings and rhythms to it. And so I finally decided I need to get this checked out. So I went to the doctor, got a physical, and the physical led to this idea that I needed to take a stress test. So I went to get a stress test and hooked me all up to all kinds of wires and machines and then got me on the treadmill. I started to walk and then after a while, I started to run and then run up an incline. I was going pretty hard. And when I was done, they took all the results and when the results came back, the doctor said, hey, your heart's fine. In fact, he said, I'll give you a five-year guarantee. Your next five years, you should have no heart problems at all. I'm like, Shh, that's great. Of course, that means I only have two years left on my warranty, so uh, I'll enjoy these last two years. But the truth is, after that happened, after I had the stress test, the results came back, you know what, what happened next? My heart stopped acting weird. I didn't have the weird feelings and rhythms going on and the strange sensations. And so personally, what I think was happening is I was dealing with anxiety, some stress, maybe some type of panic attacks. But once I found, figured out what the truth was, what was going on, and once all those things came together, my brain, my mind, and my heart, they all began to recalibrate, and everything's really been fine ever since. But you know what the hardest part of that whole situation was? Admitting that I had a problem. Admitting that there was something not right with my heart. And if I'm honest, that's probably the biggest thing that keeps me from dealing with anything that's going on in my life is admitting that I'm wrong or admitting I have a problem. And that truth has kept me from being a good husband, a good father, a good pastor, a good leader, and a good friend. And so here's the truth I want you to think about and something that I've had to deal with in my own life is that it's really impossible to recalibrate something that we don't see has a problem. So last week we started this series about recalibrating. We focused in on your, your mind. The Bible has a lot to say about your mind. And what we landed on was this understanding that in order to recalibrate our minds, we need to have this uh, daily mental connection to God's Word. And it kind of just recalibrates our hearts as we meditate on His Word. So today we're going to focus in on our hearts. Now while some of you may need to see someone about your physical heart, that's not what we're going to be dealing with today. What we're going to be talking about is your true inner self. The Bible describes that as your heart. The Bible authors actually say a lot about your heart. And so whenever they mention that, they're most typically referring to your inner will, your inner you, that, that true you. And so that has a lot to do about the things that you want to do, things that you're passionate about. And we've all had those moments when our brain has told us one thing and our heart is telling us something else. We've had that tension, haven't you? And so all of us have gone through our, our lives, sometimes ignoring our brain and following our heart. And so the basic definition that we're working with today is we're, whenever we say heart, we're talking about your inner self or your inner will. What's that true you, the will of your true you? So why is it so important to talk about your heart? Well, just like um, our physical hearts can have problems and issues that need to be checked out, um, your inner self or your inner heart can have problems as well. I mean, listen, we've all had those moments where someone has said or you've experienced a broken heart or you've heard of someone that got sick or maybe died and you've had a heavy heart. Or maybe you've had that, that phrase where my heart is just so full of good things. And that's part of what our heart holds is a lot of the good stuff that goes on. So things like uh, love and joy, relationships, happiness, the things that we're just really passionate about, those flow from our inner self, flows from our hearts. But the heart isn't just the place where good stuff comes from. It's also the primary place where we harbor our hurts and our brokenness, hate, anger, evil it has this way of residing in our hearts. In fact, the Bible has a list of things that can reside and take up place in your heart. Things like uh, bitterness, deceit, envy, pride, these are all things that hang out in the heart. And Jesus even takes that a step further when he says that in our hearts, um, in Matthew chapter 15, verse 19, he says that in our hearts um, we harbor things like murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, theft, false testimony, and slander, that these things come from our hearts and come out into our behaviors and our actions. 
And so over the, over the last three months of this COVID-19 pandemic, a lot has happened to our hearts. Some of it has been really good. Some relationships have been renewed. Families have connected or reconnected. There have been opportunities for you to be generous or to help your neighbors and to, to help and love and to serve. And a lot of you have done that and it's been amazing. But on the flip side though, there have been a lot of hurtful things that have probably happened to our hearts as well. So maybe uh, relationships have been broken. Something has happened in your marriage and so it's hurt you. And so that brokenness goes into your heart. And as it hangs out in your heart, it kind of turns into anger or bitterness. And so on the outside, you may look normal, like everything's fine, but on the inside, your heart is full of anger and sometimes it leaks out and impacts those around you. Some of us have had a lot of free time on our hands, and sometimes that can be really good if you're productive with it, but sometimes when we're not very productive with our free time, we can pick up some bad habits. And so as you're hanging out, maybe on the internet or watching different things on uh, different uh, video platforms, maybe you've been watching some things, maybe pornography, maybe you've been overeating, you've been binging on things, wasting your time, maybe you've picked up some other addictions as you've tried to deal with some of the, the fears and the emotions that have come with this, so things like alcohol or drugs, and then those things spill over to deceit, slander, envy, lies, deceit, and it, it goes on and on, and then it impacts our relationships as well. And so maybe we're dealing with a lot of stuff in our hearts that we've covered over and it looks like everything's fine, but in our hearts, there's a lot of problems. And then probably the last few weeks, probably the biggest thing that has stirred in our hearts has been this issue of racism, of injustice, and how do we deal with that? And I know it's stirred up a lot of feelings and a lot of emotions, and some have been very positive and passionate. It's been really cool to see people respond in positive ways. But on the flip side, it's been hard to acknowledge things and talk about evil and how racism can impact, impact us and then how we look at people and judge people. And so, in other words, we're realizing that there's a lot of heart problems that are going on and this pandemic has brought a lot of that to the surface. So here's the bottom line is that our hearts, probably your heart, could probably use some recalibration. So what's that look like for us? What's the Bible say about it? Well, in the Old Testament book of Samuel, specifically chapter 11, we read a situation where King David, described as a man after God's own heart, um, has a moment where he commits adultery with a woman by the name of Bathsheba. He tries to cover up the murder, or the adultery, by murdering uh, Bathsheba's husband. He thinks everything's fine, that there's no issues, but as we read, the, uh, the guilt ends up in his heart. And then God says to the prophet Nathan to call out David and let David know, hey, listen, what you've tried to cover up, it's, it's still there. And so Nathan exposes David's sin. And David is a broken man as he deals with the fallout and the consequences of his sin. And so he writes a psalm, Psalm 51 specifically. It's a very powerful psalm of, about the heart and about recalibration and restoration. And yeah, if you have some time today or this week, I'd really like you to meditate and read through chapter uh, 51 of Psalm. But it's in this psalm that David's going to give us a couple ways that we can continue to um, recalibrate our hearts as we struggle with our hurts and our brokenness that we deal with. So I'm going to take you down to verse 10, and I want you to listen to what David writes about the heart. Now remember, he's dealing with the pain and fallout of his sin. He says, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. So what David understands is a very important truth, and that is he can't fix what's wrong in his heart. The feelings and the guilt and the shame, he can't fix it, but he knows that God can. And what you need to understand that God can fix our hearts, like he's the one that created us and he can restore us and he can put us back together. In fact, he loves us so much and he's called us to love him and he wants to be a part of that process. And that's one of the amazing things about God is that his grace and his desire to help us with our hearts and what's going on in the inside, it is always there. So how does God fix our hearts? Well, here's a good analogy for you to remember. Um, I want you to think of someone who has their physical heart that is out of rhythm, it's not beating correctly. And most of us have heard of a pacemaker. And a pacemaker is essentially this tiny computer 
that's attached with electrodes to your heart. And it is constantly measuring the rhythms and the beating of your heart. And whenever it senses that your heart is out of rhythm, it sends a little electrical stimulus through those electrodes and it gets your heart beating back in rhythm. And here's what God does, is He does essentially the same exact thing. He gives us a pacemaker to do that. You see, when you put your faith in God, when you devote your life to following Jesus, He actually gives you His Spirit. The phrase that we use to describe God's Spirit is His Holy Spirit. And so when you put your faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit takes up refuge inside of you, in your heart, and begins to do heart surgery, begins to, to clean up the mess, and begins to put things back together. And the Holy Spirit is constantly monitoring your heart and is giving us information that we need to respond to to adjust our lives to. So when we feel guilty over like something that we said, that we said in anger or a lie that we told or, a, or gossip or something, that feeling that stirs up inside of us, it's the Holy Spirit working on our heart. That lustful thought that comes into your mind that you need to put away, it's the Holy Spirit trying to get your heart back in rhythm. Or... Um, that moment when you are reaping the consequences of things, something that you did in anger, like punch a wall or throw something that's shattered and is broken. And as you're cleaning it up and you feel this wave of regret over all the carnage that has happened because of your anger, that feeling of regret, that's the Holy Spirit. God has put the Holy Spirit in our hearts to help clean us up, to get us back in rhythm. And that's why it's important that we remind ourselves that we need to have faith in God and trust Him and allow His Holy Spirit to work in our hearts. But the cool thing is, I want you to remind me about is that God answers David, David's prayer. Like, He puts David back together. He restores him, and God wants to do the same exact thing to each and every one of us. So you need to look at your relationship with God and allow the Holy Spirit to begin to do this work in your life. But there's an important first step, though, that needs to take place for God to do this, to fix our hearts. I want you to jump down to verse 17 of what David is writing, and look at what he writes. He says, My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. What David offers God is his broken and contrite, or contrite means crushed, this crushed heart. David is offering his broken heart. And this is a very powerful nugget of truth that we need to hold on to, and that is, God will never despise your broken or crushed heart. You may, but God won't. So in other words, the one thing keeping God from fixing you and recalibrating your heart is you. David describes a theme which runs throughout the entire Bible. You see this everywhere in the Bible, and that is our hearts have a problem. They're hard, they're stubborn, they're prideful, they're like rocks, they're like stones. And they end up being these obstacles that God can't work with because of our own pride and our own selfishness. And so consistently what you see throughout the Bible is God's frustration. He loves people and wants to work with them, but because of the hardness of their heart, there's these barriers. And here's the thing that's amazing about God is that He will honor our decision. If we don't want Him in, his li in our life, He won't. But here's the hope, and that is, if we want our hearts recalibrated, it will happen. If you can muster the courage to admit your brokenness, God will heal your heart. You see, it's on you. If you're willing to admit your brokenness, God will heal your heart. So what does that look like in everyday life? What's that look like for you? Well, here's a couple things you can think about. Here's the first thing. You need to do a heart check. See, the good thing is the Holy Spirit wants to help us with this, wants to help us check our hearts, help us look in the mirror, look deep at what's going on. And so for some of us, I think we need to take an inventory. We need to get some alone time, a quiet time, and just think about your life. Where are your anger? Where's your anger coming from? What's frustrating you? What are some of the habits that you feel bad about that have isolated you? What are some relationships that you need to repair? And you just need to begin to have a conversation with God and figure out what are the things that need to happen to change. I think that's happened the last few weeks as we dealt with injustice, as we dealt with racism, as we looked at broken relationships and all the things that are going on in our world. We need to do a heart check and see what's wrong. And here's the second thing you need to do. You need to follow the doctor's orders. You need to follow the doctor's instructions. 
God is our great physician and he wants to heal your heart. But that means that you have to take the prescription that he hands you and you have to do it. And so many of us have ignored our doctor's instructions with so many things. And sometimes we do that with God. It's like he literally wants to help you, but we ignore him and what he's giving us to do. So my encouragement to you is like when you identify what's wrong, when the Holy Spirit brings that to the surface, then do what God is asking you to do. And so for some of you, that means maybe something really simple, just acknowledging your sin and, and confessing it to God. Um, for others, it might literally be to the point where it is so embedded in your heart, you need an accountability partner, someone that can really help you. Um, for others, um, it may be that God is calling you to repair a relationship and to reconcile with someone else or reconcile with maybe uh, people that you've kind of kept at a distance. For some of you, it's going to be gener generosity and serving. But whatever the case may be, God cares about your heart and he wants to help heal it. And so listen to his instructions. Listen to some of the hard things that he's going to ask us to do because he cares about your heart so much that he's going to ask you to do some maybe difficult and challenging things. But that doesn't mean we ignore them because we know that God is good and he cares about what's going on inside of our hearts. But here's the hope that I have. Um, I'm sitting here on the campus of the University of Iowa, which isn't too far from the old, old capital. And it was just last week that the old capital was uh, a scene. In fact, this whole downtown area and throughout our city in Coralville was a scene of people that were protesting, that were angry. What we've learned about our country, about our community, about a lot of us, is that uh, this pandemic and some of the events that have happened within it have brought things of the heart to the surface. And, and this is one of the indicators that all of us can look at that, that there's a problem. Is like when these things begin to surface, so when there's frustration, when there's this injustice, when people protest, um, and then as people look to respond about why are they doing this and how should I respond and they're wrong and I'm wrong, there can be a lot of finger pointing and a lot of people placing blame on a lot of different folks and situations and reasons for what is going on. But I want to just give you a simple solution to what God wants to do to heal us, uh, to heal our community, and to heal our land. And that is we have to look in the mirror and we have to look inside our hearts. It's not going to happen by pointing fingers and casting blame, but it's going to happen when we each deal with what's going on inside of our hearts. So one of the things I'd challenge you to do um, today and throughout this week is think about your heart and ask God to help begin to change whatever's broken inside of it. And it's different for each and every one of us. It's different for me as it is different for you. But God cares about us and wants to heal our hearts. So my challenge is, don't I look in your heart, but muster the courage to admit your brokenness and God's promises that He will heal your heart. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these people that are engaged online with this discussion and this study. I pray that your Holy Spirit would move amongst us. And right now my prayer is very specific for all of us as we contemplate the words of David as he deals with a broken heart, that we would look at our hearts. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would stir and bring to the surface the issues that we need to deal with. Um, broken relationships in our own life, um, habits, addictions, hurts that we keep holding on to. For some of us, it's been how we deal this, with the issue of racism and, and hurts and injustice uh, in our lives, in our community, and those around us. So Father, I pray that we would each individually look to the things that we can change and improve on, and that your Holy Spirit would begin that healing. But Father, I also would ask that you would give us the courage, each of us the courage to respond and to take up the instructions that you are giving, the things that we need to do to change and allow this healing to take place inside of us. And I'm just thankful that you gave us Jesus, who died on the cross to pay for our sins and our injustice so that we could be restored not only to you, but reconciled to each other. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Tom, for sharing those encouraging words from the life of David about how we can recalibrate our hearts to know God. Today, as we turn into a time of communion, I want to look at a passage of Scripture from the book of Luke, chapter 22. And I want to ask the question before we get into that, what is something that you have been eager to do? Maybe recently you've been eager to get out of your house 
uh, go back to work, whatever it might be, maybe even to come back into the church buildings. Uh, maybe you're eager to get married or buy a new car or move into a new home. Whatever you might have been eager about, Jesus was very eager to do something with his disciples that was a lasting reminder of what his sacrifice on the cross was going to be for us. And he shares that with us in Luke chapter 22, verses 14 and following. He says this, When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until I find fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not eat, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now Jesus said he was eager to share this Passover meal with his disciples. And I'm sure his disciples were eager to share this as well. But I bet they forgot some of the last words that Jesus said at the end of verse 14 and 15. He says, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. I bet they missed that phrase, before I suffer. Jesus, at the night of his Passover, the night that he instituted communion, he knew that suffering was ahead. But he also knew that that suffering would bring redemption to all mankind. And that allowed him to look eagerly forward to this meal. So today, as we celebrate communion, whether you're in the church body, in the church facility, or you're at home, sit there and eagerly take communion and think about the sacrifice that Jesus has made to redeem us and all of mankind. Let's pray. God, I am so thankful to Jesus and his love for us, how he was willing to sacrifice and lay down his life for us. God, as we take this time of communion, as we take this bread that represents his body, and we take this juice as it represents his spilled blood for us, God, help us to remember and to reflect back to his suffering and his death, and more importantly, God, to his resurrection that brings us redemption and the eternal life with you. God, be with us as we continue this day, as we continue to worship in this time of communion. It's in Christ's name we pray. I'm laying down I wanna know
so much for joining us at Iowa City Church online today. We love you, have a great day, and we'll see you next time.